Uh, this is officially, I didn't even tell you this, this is uh, the first episode of season 10 of the Storytelling ooh, ooh, Lab. Ooh. Uh, a very special guest because of this uh, first episode of the season. So, Heather, welcome to the show. It's good to see you and connect with you officially. It's an honor, and I think we connected because you said something about needing more Southerners on the show. So I just thought, you know, I, we got to do what you got to do here. I definitely. Where are you based again? Augusta, Georgia. So I'm not far Augusta. from you. Augusta, Georgia. Yeah, not, mm -hmm. not far at all. No, I, 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 I heard just, just a teeny tiny bit of that little little twang and it always catches my ear when i hear that and i get very excited um so Let me yeah tell you we, something i was just in yeah. lexington kentucky and i was <laughs> in the airport uh -huh. and this dude was with this long well oh, anyway we just had a long conversation about something and he goes where are you from and i said augusta georgia and he goes i could never tell you don't have a southern accent at all and i'm like only in kentucky would they not hear <laughs> georgia accents because they have they are country well, I think you might be like me where we work in the professional world quite a bit and it kind of ebbs and flows. It comes back. But when we get around our people or we get excited it's or strong. mad or drunk, then in, the, the, in, the, in those moments, it tends to reveal itself. Because I've heard that, too. And I've had that same interaction where people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it's, it's right there. Anyways, welcome Southern Bell to the <laughs> Storytelling Lab. I have a lot of things I want to talk to you about. Um, and I'm sure that this will go many different directions. Because it seems like you're involved in a lot of different aspects of what you do. So an interesting question that I often kind of kick off these conversations with that I'm genuinely curious ab uh, about because I, I, I still struggle to answer this question, to be fair, is uh, how do you, like, if I met you mm -hmm. in, in, where did you meet that person? In the airport in Kentucky. And I asked you what you do mm -hmm. for a living, which is not like, I'm a bricklayer or I'm a doctor, right? It's kind of like, how do you answer that question? I help visionaries execute on their ideas. So you have big, crazy, wild ideas that you want to put out in the world, but you're a visionary. And so sometimes you get hung up on, oh my God, I got to set up a landing page. And, oh my God, I got to have this email funnel, blah, blah. I'm the integrator for those folks. So I mm. have a gift for leadership and I understand that vocabulary of visionaries, but I'm also very type A organized mm -hmm. and a doer. So I'm that bridge between big ideas and execution. Oh. Now, I probably wouldn't say that in the airport. No. Probably what I would say is I work with business owners in their processes or their systems, but that don't sound as sexy. No, that's very boring. I like what I said before. I should yes. With that. Yes. And story, it, I felt it? like you had rehearsed that before. Uh, and I also like the integrator. That's a great, that's a great uh, term that you it's use. It's not a term I came up with. It's from rocket fuel. So there's visionaries and there's integrators. There's people who have big ideas, but they're not oh. necessarily good at the execution part. Yeah. The integrators are good at the executing, but sometimes struggle with the vision part. And I'm kind of weird. I'm good with both of those worlds and I'm usually the bridge between them. Oh, that's exciting. It's very true. I've seen that reflected in a lot of different uh, fields and areas that I've worked in. There, there generally is the, the, there generally are those two roles. Mm -hmm. um, when you say the word visionary, when you say that, I can't help but think like, Big, big Steve Jobs, you know, like big picture dreamer, that type of visionary. Is that what you mean? Or can anybody be a visionary? I don't know if anybody can be a visionary because that's okay, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I would, my gut says people aren't all bent towards that. Um, mm -hmm. There are some folks who came out of the womb bent a little different mm -hmm. and they have this audacity to believe that they can change something about this world. Not only do they have the audacity to believe that, but they have the gut slash um, ignorance. And I mean that in the most loving way to think that they actually will and can and start putting action to it. I love those people. Um, these are folks who usually fall in love with some kind of industry, whether it's music or entertainment or whether it's mental health therapy or et cetera, but they see something wrong with it. And they're like, you know what? I want to be a change maker. I want to be a leader here. And I want to do things a little bit differently. So they got a mission, they got a chip on their shoulder um, and they're just excited to change everything about it. But usually it kind of sometimes they get stuck there because they don't even have the manpower to execute on it or their personality isn't set up to sit at a computer for five hours and set up a landing page. Heard that. Um, What's your background? Like what led you to, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> Is that a hard like, question? Who are you? 
Um, background. Uh, you from? Yeah. Who's your mental, parents? mental health therapy. So I was oh. went to school to be a therapist. I loved it. Um, I was good at it because I love people and I'm fascinated with why we are the way that we are. Mm -hmm. um, but I started noticing that I got really lit up when I was hanging out with people who wanted to change culture and wanted to shift policy and wanted to move things. So you kind of think about a therapist working on an individual level, which I, God, there are gifts to this world. We need people like right. that. I was bent a little bit more towards groups and mm -hmm. systems and kind of the big picture. So I decided to bring a lot of my work online and move away from the mental health therapy world. And I ended up working with a lot of therapists in the capacity I was just sharing with you. Um, and yeah, that's my background. It's interesting. I mean, it makes very, it makes a lot of sense how you made that transition because I think that a lot of when you do that type of work, I do similar work. My background is I'm, I'm a filmmaker, uh, prime, mostly documentaries. Yeah. I'm really jealous that about that. That sounds way cooler. <laughs> it's, 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 it's cool. It's not a documentary well, filmmaker. Okay. Come on. Is that cool? Go ahead. Am I? Am, am that's I, a cool thing. Heather, like, am what I cool? It, yes. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Cool. Sorry, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. I love it. And like, when we find those things that we love, uh, it's not certainly not easy to make a career out of them often, um, but we do so because we love it. Um, so it's not, uh, yeah, it's, I, I like what I do. It gives me the chance to learn a lot, meet a lot of people, people that want to inspire, uh, create that change that you, that you talked about. Um, but somewhere along the lines, the downside, one of the downsides of documentary filmmaking or any kind of filmmaking is it's project based. Um, and so about five or six years ago, I started working with people and started teaching storytelling, coaching, consulting, and things mm -hmm. like that for like in between those, uh, the ebbs, um, in between projects. And when the pandemic hit, I wasn't traveling and public speaking as, as much anymore. I mean, it kind of took a halt for sure there in the beginning. And so that's when I started coaching people, finding their story, finding their vo voice to create the change they want to in the world as well. I'd mentioned before we started recording that we, I feel like we do similar work yeah, um, and are passionate about similar things. But I say all that to say, often people would say this feels like therapy when we go through it, because we would have to like, we'd have to dive deep and, and pull them apart to see what makes them them because so often we get locked into this this is how i should act or or work or perform this is how i think i should act this is how my mom made me feel like i should act or mm -hmm. my boss or whomever mm -hmm. and it's not aligned with who we truly are and i also mentioned before we started that like even if you and i did the same exact thing with the same exact budget and size team or whatever we would we should inherently approach it differently because yeah. we are different people with different experiences. But that's what I try to help people do. And often they feel like they've gone through a, a therapy session because yeah. we're really diving into who they are as people. So to me, when you say that, I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. It's all just understanding people. A hundred percent. Yeah. I usually say I left like that world, but it's like the biggest lie ever because just like you, that's my experience. I'll get on calls with like some kind of mover or shaker who wants to, you know, build this big thing or whatever. And it always circles back down to finding your voice, mm -hmm. your self-worth. Is this going to matter? I mean, it's like really deep. And that's so good to hear um, because we realize we're all freaking human. And some people come across as like these big badass, like whatever. But at the totally. end of the day, when you really start peeling back the layers, thank God we're all created so similarly mm -hmm. and deal with the same issues. Some people move in it and act anyway, and some people let it cripple them. That's the differentiator. Okay, let's stay right there, because what I was going to say is, I think it's pretty awesome what you did as well, and I think there are a lot of people out there that might be a whatever, therapist, lawyer, whatever it is, and I've heard these stories before, that see what you do now and feel a calling in their hearts to want to do something, help people who are wanting to change the world, maybe change the world themselves. Maybe they're, maybe they're a visionary, maybe they're an integrator, but they're being held back by something feeling of security. Who knows mm -hmm. what that might be, but they would want to take the leap. Now you took that leap. I'm not sure how long you, how long ago was it when you transitioned out of therapy and into what you're doing now? I want to say 
five years. Okay. Six years. Ooh, we got mm -hmm. a sim similar, similar cycle. Okay. So that wasn't like one day you said like, okay, I'm stopping this and I'm going to start this. I'm really interested because stories are all about that transformation, right? I'm right. really interested in that transition and what were the things that helped you take the leap? What were the action steps that 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 you uh, that you followed? Like, think about someone else who's hearing this and being like, "I want to do something like that." Like, how do they do it? I did take the leap um, in a sense of I got we were moving here to Augusta, Georgia, and I got mm -hmm. three job offers to be a therapist, and I turned them all down. Mm -hmm. um, when I got the offer, I cried. And I called my husband and I said, I got the job. And he's like, why are you crying? Like most people don't cry when they get accepted. But I knew in my soul and my gut that I needed to do something different. But what was frustrating about that is I didn't know what that was. And I think that's yeah. what sometimes really difficult is we feel this tension and this dissatisfaction and this unease. And there's almost a guilt there. It's like you should be um, content. You should be happy. You should be grateful. And there's almost this pressure to kind of go back into this complacency. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by complacency is not like an outward manifestation of complacency because that that's not across the board for everybody. Complacency in yourself where you know that there's something more, but you feel dumb, ridiculous, irresponsible, irresponsible for going okay. after it. So it was very hard, very, very, very hard turning those job offers down. Um, we had just moved to a new city. We had a new family. We weren't making tons of money. We really could have used the income that that was coming to bring brought in. Um, so it was a huge sacrifice, not only, you know, for me and my pride, but also to, you know, my husband, he was very understanding That's and good. very, very supportive, but I had to hustle. I immediately started to get some freelance clients and do something because I needed to kind of supplement that income. So I'm sharing all this to say that there was a lot of transitions. Yeah. So I knew that I wanted to do something more. I wasn't sure what it was. I knew that wasn't it going and getting those, those jobs. Um, I looked at what was in my hand and said, what could I, what's marketable right now? Um, mm. I'm a great at production, editing. Um, I had a lot of experience in photography in that whole world. I had okay. been podcasting for some time, so I knew enough about audio editing to get me in trouble. So I immediately started getting freelance clients in that world. Okay, That's not what I wanted to do full time, mm. but it gave me some space. It gave me the freedom to kind of explore. And that was five or six years ago. And like fast forward, it's been a hell of a ride uh, and a lot of transitions and iterations there. Um, that's the what, short version. What was the podcast that you had back then? It was called Unconventional, mm -hmm. which later formed into Unconventional Leaders. We did that for 523 episodes. Um, week, like uh, multiple times a week? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yikes. Yep. I've done over a thousand between all the different shows. And was that therapy based? No, it was, no, it was uh, leadership, entrepreneurship. Um, going While you were still, still a therapist? Uh, no, it was when I quit that. I've been, I did that over the past five, six years. I've put in a thousand episodes. Since so that then. was one of the first things you did then after you quit was like, I'm going to just start. You find your voice by using your voice. I didn't know what. I was meant to do and what I was supposed to say. So I decided to imperfectly start producing a show and fumble my way through it. And a lot of times, and I, I think it's awesome when people say, I was born to do this. I was yeah. not that way. No I didn't me. know. So I knew to be faithful to show up on this and it's taken me a long time and I'm still figuring it out mm -hmm. what my message is and how I need to articulate it. I've gotten better, but it took a thousand episodes it took freelancing at the beginning and taking crappy jobs. Grind, dude. Grind. Grind. I sound like a bro, don't I? <laughs> hustle. So you're, hustle bro. you're a hustle, bro. No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Dude, no. that, that genre, if we will, is so like, I don't know. I don't, I don't even want to veer <laughs> into that because it's just so frustrating. Anyway. Um, There's something to learn with them. In the same way that there's something to learn from the more feminine energy. I can accept that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, of course. I, I, I think that's a great way to approach it. It's like there's something to pick, a, pick to take rather from anything and anyone. 
Correct. Even if that sometimes like the, some of the documentary filmmakers, I, I kind of learned, I did go to school for production, but not like a film school, but mm -hmm. I learned in the old, like apprenticeship method, right? I trained other documentary filmmakers and the first few that I did, I equally, if not more learned things like not to do <laughs> than sure. things to do. So even sure. if you're pulling something like that away, as long as, long as you can grow. So I, I can accept that about the hustle bro uh, genre. Um, uh, but it also, it often does get out of hand. Um, Quick question. What is that image behind you? It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh, have to describe it for those that aren't watching but listening. Frank Moth is a um, couple out in Europe, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they have their identities hidden. One of them's called Frank and the other one's called Moth. And they make art uh, just like this, where if you're listening, it's a woman and there are a bunch of, it's like a plant coming out of her head. For me, I kind of regret getting it now because now all it sees her nose and like just it's really distracting. But when I first saw this, I thought about um, inspiration and ideas. Yeah. And I do flow with a lot of masculine energy. Um, I mentioned before, I'm very type A. I'm organized. I'm a driver. I move things forward. If you tell me there's a project, we'll have a folder and a spreadsheet and a plan <laughs> by 6 p.m. today. And I will put you in ClickUp and you'll be assigned something. <laughs> However, what I've been trying to tap into a lot more is my feminine energy and my ideas, my inspiration. And so yeah. that kind of reminds me to check in and remember that there's something else at work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. Um, often people are like, you what you were alluding to like I, I i want to do something i don't know what my bigger purpose is right i feel mm -hmm. like there's something inside of me i've always felt this way mm -hmm. i don't know how to find my purpose what to that person what do you say you did say this amazing line like you find your voice by using it which i yep. just like plus 1000 to that i love that so much um for someone who doesn't know what they want to do what other, where else can they start to try to pursue that quest of even finding out what it is before they start grinding? This isn't mine. I think it's Marie Farlow. I don't, can't remember who said it first. Mm. Action creates clarity. I want everybody to go get that tattooed on their forehead and in their butt. Okay. <laughs> Action creates clarity. We don't know what something is until sometimes we do it and we look at it. You know, this is a creative. Sometimes a film will show you what it is through the process of freaking making it. We have ideas of what something should be, but it's not until we do it, we find out what it is. And so what was the last small idea that you had inviting Bob over for dinner, creating this small little tiny event? We don't want to be viewed as a beginner. Mm -hmm. So we dismiss all these tiny little action items that God gave us to do and we're not mm -hmm. faithful with them. So why is he going to give us the next big part of the plan if we weren't faithful with the small tiny step? Mm. You know, that just take action cliche or mantra is is often used very accurate i want to say i'm not about to drag it i i'm in full support of that but i think where it gets misconstrued is people think because the, the the um counter to that is like yeah, yeah okay but like because you hear it in filmmaking where just go make movies it's like yeah but dude i don't know where to start like i can't just go tomorrow and make a movie right the thing i i think people misunderstand about that is like it's not that that initial action maybe in in, in one one in a million chances it's not that the initial action is going to be the thing that breaks you it's that that's the first little step and you have no idea what will manifest through that often it's just a connection it's just a relationship that was made you just are out there and you meet another person who just wanted to go make a no budget film on the weekends yeah. and y'all start brainstorming an idea that doesn't come to fruition fruition until five years from then correct and then you write and direct your first feature that goes to a film festival right you you, you don't know where it's going to come from but it's almost never a product or like the end result of that initial action. It always evolves into something yes. else. And that's the point of just taking action. It's not that your initial action is going to make you successful. Right. It's that you're going to be out there moving and shaking with other people who are moving and shaking and doors start to open that way. If you are sitting on the couch, no doors of opportunity are going to open themselves up to you. Preach. Preach. Right? Preach. I'm getting, I'm getting heated. I'm getting, I'm sweating too. Are y'all feeling this? This is good. And here, here's something I've had to learn. And, and y'all, y'all forgive me if this wasn't your experience, but 
what's most specific is most universal. So hopefully you'll find yourself somewhere in this, but I've had a lot of deep conditioning around religion that I've had to let go of. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I grew up kind of being conditioned to believe is that there's this super specific one plan that you're either, you know, I've had to unlearn that we like serve like a really cruel God that if you go one direction over here that you're effed and like the plan is like not working. And that's yeah. crippled me where I've been like, is this right? Is this the right move? Is this the right production to collaborate with? Is this the right person? And to your point, that's not the point. The point is, is that we're in motion and in action and energetically we start to attract things because we're somebody who can be trusted no matter what you believe in. And so for me, I've had to let go of that narrative that there's this one path for Heather Parody. And if you F it up, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop the, the, the P word. Uh, I think our boy, Stephen Pressfield might've said this. <laughs> When he was like, oh, you know, he interviewed him, right? Do y'all know that? Does it? Do you get? Did I tell you guys? That I don't yet? know. Um, but no, he said, he said, he said, he said something like, when you forecast, you know, thinking about where you're trying to go, to go, not visualizing it as like one dot, one little point, but mm -hmm. rather a horizon that you're trying, like trying to reach, because that thing that you may land on maybe just adjacent to where you know where right. you started but right. so often we think that it is one path as you just said and if we don't do that we think it's a failure mm -hmm. and that our complete our life is a complete waste right and it's like you don't know where you will end up right but right. the point is to go towards that horizon right that's that's a destination you can reach without it having to be that single tree also you might get there to that single tree or that single point and realize it's not what you thought it was yes right actually right. this tree is dying Right. I thought it looked beautiful from afar, but I get here. It's not what I wanted. Right. So that you can't lock into that. And I also want to plug this. I have questions uh, for you about books as well. I'm reading one right now that I have to just uh, um, mention. I'm only like two uh, uh, chapters in, but by what you just said, it's called The In Between. And it is a story. Um, nurse Hadley, she's a hospice nurse. It's very, very, came out very recently. And so she tells the stories. Each chapter is like a, a, a patient of hers mm -hmm. that she helped transition the in between, right? And she's telling these super powerful stories about what happens. But she had that same struggle because she grew up in a very southern religious yep. household, as we all did. And her life through her uh, major curveball when she got uh, this is not really a spoiler alert, but she got pregnant at like 18 or 19. And she thought her path was this one, this one certain way. Mm -hmm. She said almost exactly what you did. And I think you first of all, you would love that book. And I think really anyone else would, too. But it's the sharing of these significant stories and moments of someone very you know, specific point in their life when they are transitioning to the other side and the lessons that we can learn from those moments. And it is like, I'm two chapters in and it is so, so powerful. Mm. Um, but I think that's a, a great point that you made that too often people do is, is, um, is lock themselves into believing that it can only happen one way. Right. I mean, isn't it a Southern saying you can, you can, there, there's multiple ways to skin a cat. I don't even know where that originates from, but it's, and you know this too, as a professional, um, it speaks volume when you have the initiative to create a body of work. Mm. And even if that body of work is not top of the line or perfect, it shows character that you've taken initiative. And even if you have a freaking cell phone that you're making stuff, yeah. you know, and people respect that. I think people are way more forgiving of limited resources and less totally. forgiving of people who are just lazy and waiting on perfect moments. Mm. I agree with that. I know that a lot of your content is about creativity. About yeah, how I to, love it. Do you yeah. like it? Yeah. You love it too. Okay. Well, you yeah. have to. I mean, I, I, it's my <laughs> world, right? Yep. Um, yep. Uh, but I also... I also kind of help people that I don't label it as, as such, but it is helping people that aren't necessarily creative because I kind of who I seek to serve. And I learned this through documentary filmmaking, like the hard way is like, is when I came out of my last feature film or my first feature film, rather, I was like, all right, that was very hard to do completely by myself. Like I need to take these lessons I've learned and, and try to use them in a way that like helps people. 
And that's when everybody started becoming content creators about, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And mm -hmm. not all of them are writers or mm -hmm. artists or filmmakers, right? So my people became the people who were like, under-resourced, overwhelmed, you yep. know, trying to connect with people through video often and not knowing where to begin. So I just try to chill them out and understand how to tell stories and speak from the heart. Um, so being creative is obviously a, a part of that, but I, I love a lot of the content that you create based on that. And I just want to start off with like, why should one be creative? What is the purpose? Like, what is it? Why? You are limited in your ideas and the quality of those ideas if you don't foster creativity. So you have a business and we limit creativity so much to like, I'm good at camera angles. <laughs> Sometimes creativity manifests its way in thinking outside of the box about a problem or connecting with somebody in a unique way that someone else hasn't. So if you want to move the ball forward in any endeavor, you're limiting yourself by not tapping into your creative potential. And for me, the reason I love creativity so much, A, I'm geeking out. Like I would go to your film set and just watch all the cameras. And I love sets. I love that whole world. I think it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. But what's really captured my heart about the creative process is that there's a deep tide of spirituality there for me. Mm -hmm. And when I deconstructed from a lot of stuff and kind of removed myself from the, the traditional church building, I found God again through creative work because I felt like it was the gap between like our effort and our understanding and our logic and what we force and strive for. And there's this weird space over here where sometimes inspiration hits you and they call it the muse, you know. Um, and that mystery and that wonder and how to foster that is a very spiritual practice for me. And it's kind of like a church, <laughs> yeah. I guess, now that I don't go to church anymore. Um, so that's like the personal side to it. But if you are thinking I'm weird and woo, uh, the practical <laughs> side to it is you're limiting yourself. Yes. If you're not creative. I'm so glad you said it that way, because I, I would have taken it there had you not that often if I'm in business I think like, oh, well, that's them. That's right. something else. That's Correct. the musicians and the visual artists whose art I can't understand because it just looks like shapes and colors. And it's like, no, this is how humans think, right? This right. is how we solve problems. That's the best, one of the best things that you've said. And then when you put it in that language, then they're like, oh, maybe I should be creative. Also, you said how, you know, connecting with people in a, in a different way, I think is what yeah. you said. Um, Can so I give you an example? Yes. Something you did with Stephen Pressfield linked up in the show notes is his conversation with Stephen Pressfield. <laughs> At the very beginning of it, you decided that you were going to connect with him by bringing in your hometown and his hometown and having a connection there and having this conversation that I've never, I've heard so many interviews of his, I've never heard him say before. That was a creative decision on your part, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, to bring that in. I have a little bit of chills right now. Uh, thank you for saying that. I, it, I, I, I'm, it means a lot. Um, I, I also have heard a lot of those conversations. Here's what. Let's do. I'll zoom out first. Um, when we aren't really aligned with our true self, also authentic self, we try to emulate what other people do hustle this 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 gives uh hustle bro genre all over again Ooh, right we try them. we try we try to do someone else's morning routine and someone right. else, the way someone else approaches anything and not really ask ourselves like oh but is that what works best for me so similarly when you interview somebody like that and and, and a guest like that is on all you know big shows that i look up to they ask a lot of the same questions um, that are kind of easy to ask, especially for an author, right? You're talking about the book and you will get a lot of the same answers, which are always great because of the person's content. They're, what they create is great, right? So I'm looking for a way uh, to stand out. I mean, part of it, I'll be honest, is self-serving. Like I don't have the numbers that maybe those shows do. One uh, how can I make my show different for mm -hmm. the audience that might fall, find this? 
Um, and also, I fully believe I have conducted over a th thousand interviews in my life. And still, every day, even just now before we, we started in, in, a, in a new venture that I have. And without question, the best way, the most effective way to get the best answers is to create a genuine connection. Yeah. I have had people on my show that are great and they got their sound bites ready and they're like, foo, 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 just, you know, delivering like that. But the conversation never feels that way. And one of the most common fee pieces of feedback I get that is most appreciated is like, oh, it was very like conversational. I really love that. That's by design. And I'm not saying the shows that are formatted aren't great. It's just something different. That doesn't work for me right. because I think I get the, the good stuff from someone, the unique stuff. By just building that connection, finding where we connect. Can we connect because we're both Southerners? Mm -hmm. Can we connect because we both grew up in the church? Like, where is it that I can understand a little bit more about how your brain works mm -hmm. and then dial that knob a little, a yeah. little bit more? And, and I was genuinely excited that, 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 that Stephen Pressfield like knew where I was from. So I'm always going to rep where I'm from. It's a small, you know, small town. And, and to do that with one of my heroes, it was an opportunity I just couldn't, couldn't miss. So. And I think I, I was questioning you before about how that even happened. Uh, the whole Stephen Pressfield gig. Are you cool sharing that now? Or are you going to do a whole separate video on that? Um, yeah. I mentioned this all, all the time to people. Um, Stephen Pressfield, it was a long journey that i have mentioned of connection here's the biggest thing don't burst through the door and be like hey hey hey, me 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 what can you give me what can you give me say it again be come on, on my show Preach. stephen yes. pressfield how yes. many of those do you think he gets a day right right or anybody like right that. so i will say you know what i told this to one of my friends one time who was like in a messy breakup and it was getting in that point where he's like freaking out and oh, no, i think she might be seeing somebody and all that stuff and i was like look man just play it cool just be cool Advice. And ever since then, I've thought about those two words can be applied to anything in life when you, when you approach it to to be more effective. At the end of the day, just be cool. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with Stephen Pressfield is I didn't want to. And I told him, like, hey, I loved your work. I'm not going to not be myself, but I'm also not. I don't want to fanboy out and act right. like I want an autograph. I want right. you're a guest on my show. I'm a damn professional, too. Right. Right. right? And I take what I do seriously and I'm not just thank you for the hand me out. You know, I just want some clout because your name. No, I want the chance to ask one of my heroes questions that I have. Right. Yeah. And so I try to be real. And so when that first connection happened, which was just over an Instagram post, I mean, we really do have so the easiest access to people that we've ever had in our lives. And it doesn't yeah. always pan out yeah. that way. But back to our point about action, Heather, it sure as hell ain't going to happen if you don't try. Yeah. Yes. Right. And so it initially started with just, I shouted out him and Brian Koppelman for something they said. Somebody on his team sent me a book, like, because they were thanking me for the tweet or the shout out. I, like, made a video about it. That was five years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. And just slowly started connecting every now and then, saying a little something until I was ready. Yeah. And then when I was ready... I made an official pitch and I didn't say like <laughs> asking somebody out on a date where you're like, Hey, would you, I don't know, kind of like to maybe one day. No, I was just like, Hey, here's my pitch. <laughs> you know, I am pitching you. I would like for you to be on my show. Here's why. But here's the thing for smaller creators. First of all, it might not be aligned with you. Don't just try to get somebody for their name status, right? Stephen Pressfield, what he talks about is exactly what I help people with. He's right. one of the best of the best to do it. So I want him on my show to help my people. Uh, there's plenty of other, like Grant Cardone. W that's not what I'm looking for. I don't have like a financial podcast, right? Like, or whatever, you know, speaking of hustle bros. Um, so it has to make sense first and foremost. Right. And it did. And I can't compete with some of the other bigger podcasts he's on in terms of numbers. So I just call it out. I also don't try to, to lie and falsely boost myself up. Hey, I don't have millions of downloads. I'm in thousands of downloads, right? Because we have we have a good fan base, but it's not it's not huge. However, 100% of them would be interested in your book, right? Yeah. So that's yep. the difference. If you're on a huge show, 
they might like the reel that they post of you, of you and they might like it, but you don't know what percentage of them are going to buy the book. If the show is just about having big names, yeah. you know, um, it depends, you know, maybe on Tim Ferriss's, maybe not on someone else's. I don't, right. I don't know, but on mine, I can say that a hundred percent of those people would be interested in most likely buy your book. And not only that, I'm going to get uh, a signed copy and I'll get, I'll give some away to people, right. To just make it more, you know, so you lean into them, you give them a reason to, and then you respect them. And if they don't, you don't badger them or if they don't respond back to you, but you try to find that point of yeah. connection of why it would be beneficial to them. When you don't have the numbers, okay. you have to be, what's the word, Heather creative mm -hmm. in your approach to mm -hmm. making that connection. This is exactly out of what you just said. Like, I can't say like, hey, you know, I've got a, a million downloads a month. Right. That's why you should use me. Right. But yeah. And he, he was a good guy. So, but I say that to people a lot of times. It's like, you have access more than ever now, but you do have to be creative about how uh, how you approach people. And you should think about why, you got to put, your, put yourself in their head. Why would they? That was uh, like a mini masterclass. I hope everybody really. I'm sorry. Liked I feel like I got very. No, sexual. don't, don't. I think we need to start shouting that message out a lot more because there's a lot of life lessons in what you just shared. I mean, I don't even care if you don't have a podcast. What you just said, you planted a seed a long time ago and you were patient. You were incredibly patient and you built a relationship with somebody. These are human mm -hmm. beings. And we have to remember that people are listening to us, people reaching out to, they're people. And you built a relationship with him yep. that he actually has mutual respect for you now, where if you ever see him out in public, when you see him out in public, there is a real genuine um, connection mm -hmm. there. Thank have, you for sharing all that. Absolutely. And there was another part I'll quickly mention. Like one time I just commented and he commented back and just said, thanks mm -hmm. through, through DM. And... um. I said something about Durham, which is where he spent his time driving the truck for, for a long, long time. And he was like, yeah, um, you know, we were just back there. It's changed a lot. You know, like we just mm -hmm. had a conversation about nothing. Yep. yep. And then I let it go. <laughs> you Good. Know? Brilliant. I let it go. Brilliant. And the thing about planting a seed, this brings us back to that, that image behind you. And I do love that, but, you know, because thoughts, connections, all of those can be treated the same way. Right. Mm -hmm. Even what we're trying to build is planting a seed. And I, I also used to talk about that. When you plant a seed, there's so much trust involved, isn't there, mm -hmm. Heather? Like, mm -hmm. you just put the seed in the dirt, and then you pour water on it. Yeah. And you make that dirt muddy. Yeah. And nothing happens. Yeah. When you do it tomorrow, nothing happens, except you're just getting muddy. Nothing happens for, like, so long. And to the point where you're like, is this thing, I don't know if this is, I don't know if it's going to work. And then one day, it's just a teeny, tiny little green sprig, and you're like, <gasps> Right. And then the yeah. point from that tiny sprig to that full plant to then where it yields, it blossoms and yields fruit or flowers goes much, much faster. But that first few weeks is really tough and you got to stick in there with it and trust it and just trust the process. And then when it's time, then you pluck that, 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 that apple off of it. Right. I waited okay. to, to the right time with him, but I built that, that relationship. And so um, I think that's why <laughs> that's why it worked. I also want to point out, you mentioned um, not fanboying, boying, boying over him. I don't know who said this, but someone uh, who's a celebrity said that whenever they first meet somebody as a fan, they'll always see them as a fan. Yeah. And that stuck out to me because you think about in our little personal development world where we crush over Stephen Pressfield and Seth Godin and all these people, it's the same thing. Like, oh my God, oh my God. That's what they'll see you as moving forward, you know? And how do you want to be presented as that forever? Or do you want to be seen as somebody who, again, to your point, is a professional in their industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. And make a real connection with them because, I mean, for me, when those people like, I, I, this make yeah I think I can say this with you and you'll handle it just fine. Like I see myself uh, this you know in the same light as them, right? Sure. I'm not at the same stage, sure. but like I want to be where they are. I don't they don't seem that far off from me. Like I don't have this thing where they're like superheroes and oh I wish I could be that. I'm like oh no I want to be that and I'm gonna try to learn how to be that. So I see us more as peers than we actually are, <laughs> or mm -hmm. like. It's like this. I see us with the potential to to become peers. Yeah. So when I make that relationship with Stephen Pressfield, like when the time comes, I may call on him for more professional or more serious advice. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I, you know, it's it's like that. Same with Seth Godin. It's like I'm not going to shoot my shot when there is no nothing to to be gained from it, right? Right. right. I would rather set it up to for us to really like play a game together one day and not just go, yeah. you know, shoot one shot out there in the backyard court and not, then all right, see you. Yeah. But thanks for the autograph. No. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I mean, that this for all of us, we can learn so much from those people, but only if we <laughs> treat them as people and see ourselves in their light. Right. I, I want to dig in a little bit deeper to that, what you just said, and ask <laughs> you a question if it's okay. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. to bring it back full circle of what we were talking about at the beginning of those beginning stages of kind of self-doubt and questioning what you should do or whatever for you to be able to say, and I fully resonate and agree with you. And it's my experience too, that I'm at a point where I can acknowledge that somebody has a different stage than me, but there's not this worth thing of like, Oh my God, they're better than me anymore. I'm like, I'll, I'll be joining you soon. <laughs> right? Yeah, like right. I'm, I'm there. It took me, it has taken me years to get to that point and build up that confidence as I'm yeah. sure that's your experience as well. So I would love to hear, you know, here's my podcaster coming out. So I know, I, know. I, I love it. Though. But I, I, I'm curious, like for you to get that kind of resolve within yourself, what has that taken? <sighs> you know, like anything, it is a daily practice. Right. You don't stay in shape by working out super hard one day <laughs> or it just happening one day. Like it's a discipline and it's a practice and you have to constantly show up mm -hmm. and also be forgiving. Uh, and remember, it's a long game. So I can't say that I'm even there yet because I'll probably have to wake up tomorrow and do it all over again. Of course. Yeah, that's what it is. And yesterday was a very challenging day. So I probably felt less so yesterday. Today I'm in the middle. Tomorrow I'm, you know, I mean, that's the thing. Ooh, there's this like visual that's been going around that's, that's like, it's just circles in a sequence that are full. Like they're all colored in and they're like, this is what people think consistency is. And then yeah, they a that. second line where there's like a quarter full, all the way full, half full, an eighth full. And they're like, but actually this is what consistency is like. And the point is that you show up to some degree to some capacity every day, yeah. you can't give a hundred percent of yourself every single day. Right. So this is very similar. Like, so I say that to say like, even my confidence and how I view myself might, might, might ebb and flow. And I just have to remind myself that these people don't have superpowers. They just right. have been doing what they do longer. They have a better strategy and they didn't give up. And back to why we love Stephen Pressfield so much is because he is one of the best at, opening the curtains and showing you you know what probably gives me more confidence than anything one of my all-time heroes probably my favorite writer um saying hey guys it took me 27 years to get yeah. my first book published like yeah. and then in his most recent book spilling all the, the the guts about you know those 27 years and what it took and so when i see somebody like that who I, whom i look up to so much and realize all the crap they went through when they were in their 20s and 30s and even in their 40s. Yeah. No, I yeah. mean, I'm like, I'm I'm just fine. Preached. I am just fine where I am. Amen. Know? Thank you. Know. you. Sorry yeah, for the you're, you're conversation. You, no, you're <laughs> quite welcome. I knew that we would get along just fine. What are you focused on? What is the way you're trying to shake up the world currently? I have recently had this realization that my gift is to stand beside the people that I admire and help them. Mm. And that's been a humbling pill for me to swallow because I have those tendencies in myself. I'm a leader. I'm a visionary. Um, I want to change the world too. But when I look at the gift that's in my hand, I've realized recently that the best way for me in this season, I always say in this season because seasons change in this season is to be a help meet and come alongside people that I believe in and work with them with their visions. Um, that's what I'm working on right now. And on the side, I, ha I have, a, I see it differently with business and clients versus audience yeah. um, audience or people that I personally don't monetize or do anything like that with. It's not a huge following um, or anything like that, but they're, they're loyal and they're incredible and they're engaged and they've changed my life with those folks. 
I'm dedicated to making a lot of content and community around what we've discussed here, which is using your voice. And with the lack of resources, with the kind of underdog unconventional mentality, being able to really lean into that and embrace it, um, because that's what makes you stand out. I don't know. Every time you say something, I, I, I get like, I get, I get emotional. Like you're, you're this has happened before on the, on the podcast, <laughs> but like, no, I just, I love, I love the way you're, you're, you're putting everything and, uh, and I love what I do. And so like, mm. I get, I, you know, I, I left the concern about like looking cool a long time ago. Uh, so I don't mind like putting myself out there, but yeah, it just like, I just felt all that. I was like tingling when you were saying that, um, what haven't you, ha uh, ha haven't you done that you're hoping to do in the near future? A lot of things. <laughs> so many things. I, I'm, I want to travel more and work outside of this culture, um, and expose myself yeah. to some different trains of thought. Um, mm -hmm. right now I'm just, you know, obviously working with Americans and kind of the Western culture, which I love and it's great and it'll always be a part of my DNA, but I'm really curious right now of how people are making change in other parts of the world and yeah. different energies. And, and I'd love to, to tap into that a little bit more. I want to lean more and more into media work with people who are involved in media. Um, I love storytelling and for me it's the best way to change anything is through a story it changes culture it changes hearts it does things that words never can that logic never will um it gets directly to the soul of people without a lot of effort and pressure and sometimes people get hit with things without realizing they were hit with it storytelling is mm -hmm. everything so attracting and working with people who are in um, visual storytelling elements, uh, media is is something that's on my list. I have done that. Uh, I want to tap a little bit more into that world because media changed my life. Mm -hmm. It gave me exposure to things that I wasn't exposed to prior growing up Southern Bible Belt Christian girl. <laughs> um, and I want to be a part of that. If only I knew someone who worked in visual media. <laughs> I think about that. I'll ponder on yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, sincerely, like, you know, you said a lot of kind things about documentary filmmaking. I think that you should get into uh, that sort of space. And if you need like any help, guidance, connections or any of that, I pledge it to you now. Thanks. Live for the world to hear. Absolutely. Like, um, I'm working on the first script right now. I'm almost okay. done with it. Um, I was so, going to ask something like that, as you yeah. should be. Like, I, yeah, I, you I, should totally be doing stuff like that. So I'm I glad do. to hear that. Yeah. I, I'm playing around with it. I have a, a lot of friends who make things, and I live right outside of Atlanta, so you can imagine that. I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a fangirl in that world where I'm, you know, been on sets and kind of just poking around and helping the way that I can. Uh, but it's a hobby right now for me. For now. For now. I bet you. I mean, once you. Yeah, you, your unique take on things. Like you've got some things to say, and and I think you should continue to find creative ways to say them. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question before we go. We've talked about Stephen Pressfield obviously a lot today, um, but also you often in your video work will be showing, will be kind of dissecting books or books that have helped you along the way. I saw you mentioned it was very recently, maybe even today, uh, Julia Cameron, The Artist's okay. Way. What are some of the other ones for those? Let's now think about our audience of people who are trying to be more creative. They're trying to create content. They're trying to be better storytellers. Oh, What are some of those? Is this too much like putting you on the spot? I just love question? books so much and I love cre the creative process and I geek out over this so much. So it's okay. another 45 minute conversation. Perfect. Um, what, yeah. What are a handful of the ones that have made the biggest um, impact on you in that space? Number one, Big Magic, Elizabeth Gilbert, because she presents this idea that ideas um, are an entity and themselves. And if you get smacked with an idea and you don't do something with it, guess what it's going to do? It's going to mosey on along to Peter Hodge, who's watching right now live, and give it to him. And I'll get mad at Peter thinking, well, that was He's my <laughs> idea. And that idea will say, well, you know what, Heather Parody, you didn't take action on me. So I went to Peter because I can trust Peter with me. Did 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 um did you make a video about this recently? Oh, I've done videos on that. Did Rick Rubin video. say this too? Rick Rubin's my next uh, cr creative act, um, a way of being one of the best creative books I've read um, as well. I think it's a kind of a 
I don't want to say a spinoff to Big Magic, but I think it goes. But didn't he say a similar point? Like that thing exists out there. Yo, that that and that really hit me hard when I watched it. I'm sorry to jump in and, Mm -hmm. and interrupt, but I had never heard that concept. But it makes so much sense. And I love it so much uh, because I do know, like in, in our world, it's like, yeah, it, you know, a, a good idea is, is, you know, there are a dime a dozen. Execution right. is everything. It's the same thing. So like in the film world, like, oh, I had that idea. It's, like, it's not hard for someone to have a good idea yep. or for a film. It's hard to put those, that idea into action, find the right people and actually go make the thing. That's what's mm-hmm. hard. So that concept of these ideas existing out there as entities, I love so again sorry to interrupt but no that one it's... really shook me up the other day just like in my own office watching your videos please continue well in, in that and i don't mean this in a heavy way but when you start to view ideas and creativity as an entity outside of yourself it forces you to respect it a little bit more as opposed yeah. to being so passive with it of like ah, whatever you know 100%. and that's what julia cameron talks about a lot in the artist way which if you haven't read that please read that but just almost this respect and this reverence for creativity as a as an entity um i'll say for storytelling specifically uh, matthew dix i know you're a moth guy i believe um matthew story dix. worthy was okay. game changing for me i do i do the moth out in atlanta um and picked up that book and it was it was game changer i could go on but um i think those are some really good those ones of course besides our stephen pressfield mutual um love. matthew dix also if you haven't chatted with him is like the sweetest guy in the world oh, that's good uh, to hear yeah he is awesome 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 so i'm sure if you ever reach out to him he would be totally down um but i i that book and i've read a lot of storytelling books as i'm sure you have too but he the way he explained it was just like so simple Tactical. yeah Tactical. yeah yeah it was it was really good but he's also just hilarious like dude is on, on well, i've been planting plans. my own seeds with him i've made several yeah. videos thank yous back and forth. I'm doing the press. Field. Oh, then you then just, yeah. then now I would just say, if you don't mind, I don't want to overstep, but just ask it's, it's a done deal now. If you've already been, been chatting for sure. hundred percent. Um, I feel like we could keep going for a long time, but uh, this was good. we're going to wrap it up. It was very good. Very good. It went, uh, uh, but be- better than I thought, but not, not, <laughs> not in the way that sounds. No, 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 no. No, 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 I knew that was going to come. Oh, no, I'm so glad you said that. That made my day. Okay. <laughs> my goal is to make things better than people think when they first meet me. That's all. Yeah, awesome. I, I knew. How about this? I knew it would be good. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> come on. Come on. Um, thank you so much. If you don't mm-hmm. mind, uh, will you stick around after sure. after we uh, hit sure. end? But for uh, everybody listening, Heather, we appreciate you. Make stuff, y'all. Make it. Don't overthink things. Action creates clarity. Just go after it. Have fun. Enjoy it. It's not that serious. Perfect.